right so we are live welcome everyone to this first live stream of engineeringtrainer.com uh, my name is luc luc hannen and i'm the founder of engineering trainer um, an online training platform for uh, uh, engineering professionals worldwide um, and today i'm going to have a discussion well we are going to have a discussion with uh, sondra and luca helgeson uh, Sondra is the, the founder of Stressman Engineering and currently holds the position of CEO. Uh, and he's also the regional director of the PSI Association in, in Scandinavia. Um, I mean, it's going to be an interesting discussion. We're going to have uh, discussions on load case setup, uh, gaps, clearances, non-linearities. Um, we'll do so by, by having a look at one of the Stressman Engineering uh, projects. Um, I'm actually really glad that, that you, you all joined us um, and I want to invite you to um, join us in the chat as well. I mean, uh, um, you know, let us know you're out there, ask questions. Uh, so, so hi Rajas, uh, hi uh, uh, Mongi, um, thanks for, for you know, uh, sharing that you're there. Um, and I also want to like uh, to invite you to, you know, head over to uh, the LinkedIn accounts of me and Sandra. Uh, connect with us, you know, ask questions. Uh, hello, Said. Uh, nice to have you as well. Uh, ask questions, you know, interact with us and, and uh, we'll be happy to show you, you know, the stuff that, that engineeringtrainer.com uh, and also uh, uh, Stressman Engineering is doing. Um, you know, the, f the best way to, to uh, stay aware of these live streams is just to follow the YouTube uh, uh, channel as well. Um, and having said that, uh, I give the word, uh, you know, to Sondra. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing good. Well, I'm, I'm really glad to have you. you. I mean, we've been discussing, we've been having discussions on pipe stress topics like, like, uh, uh, you know, about a year now, every now and then. Um, yeah. and every time, you know, d d we sparked so much, you know, enthusiasm and, and it were great technical conversations. Uh, and we just came up with the idea to, you know, just do it live and just see what happens. Just, just, you know, uh, um, exactly. discuss on the content and, and uh, mm -hmm. real technical topics and, and just see if people have questions, if they, how they join us and how they uh, interact with us. Um, mm -hmm. The recordings of these sessions will be available, uh, you know, later on on our YouTube channel, et cetera. Um, but we're really happy for those that, that uh, joined us uh, during this live session. Um, so how are you doing, doing Sandra? I mean, you must be pretty busy preparing for the, the live course that's coming up this February. Yeah, it's always like this, this, this great feeling, you know, when you have these, these courses. I've been hosting all the live classroom courses before in Pipe Stress. Mm -hmm. uh, this one is going to be a bit different because it's going to be the first online course that we're going to have. So exactly. it feels like butterflies, you know, in the stomach. So it's, it's uh, really cool to, to have that uh, opportunity. And we've been asked for this for so many years now. It's like every time we hosted a classroom course, people have been asking like, why can't you do it digitally online? And to be honest, I like to travel. So I like to see the places and the people, but now due to this virus that keeps everybody at home, yeah. uh, well, it's, it's gonna be a great opportunity to do that. Perfect, perfect. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, we, we had a great response so far. Um, and, and just to you know make the viewers aware, uh, those that, that haven't seen it yet, um, Stressman Engineering is hosting the, the Pipe Stress Fundamentals course that they gave uh, in a classroom format for the past couple of years uh, as an mm -hmm. online course uh, on engineeringtrainer.com. Um, you know, if you want to know more about it, we, we currently run for all the viewers of this live stream, uh, we actually run a discount uh, offer. Um, so, you know, if you want to more, know more about that, uh, I recommend you to. Um, Head over to, to the engineeringtrainer.com. Let me show you. Uh, head over to engineeringtrainer.com. If you scroll down from the homepage, you'll see the pipe stress fundamentals course popping up. And uh, if you go there, you see that there are two courses, a total of 16 hours of content, and they're bundled in, in a product that is available on engineeringtrainer.com. But make sure to use the uh, discount coupon if you're watching this. It will it will save you uh, um, around uh, uh, well little little less than ten percent. Um, having said that, um, uh, you know let's let's jump into the real content of this conversation. I, I guess we'll be discussing a little bit more of, of the course that is coming up uh, maybe at the end of this of this live stream. Mm -hmm. 
Um, all right. Okay, so Sandra, I'm uh, I'm uh, gonna share your screen if you're all right. It. So <laughs> it, it, it will mean you have to close uh, the live stream yourself, <laughs> otherwise people will see me. Yeah, it will be and like over. yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'm looking into infinity. Perfect. So are you sharing my screen right now? Yeah, yeah, people can see your screen. Perfect. So I just wanted to give you a quick um, background of who am I and and who is Stressman and 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 what what did we work on in the past. Just to give you a, a good glimpse into to our our world of stress, so we try to make people relax while we are doing their stress. That's like the the base fundamental uh, uh, vision for the company that that I started ten years ago, and I always been a very curious person. So I started this company out of the intent to have a company. I didn't have any limitations or boundaries on me in form of, oh, you're a piping engineer, you're a structural engineer, you're a pressure vessel engineer. So it's it's kind of, I can do, or, or I am doing a lot of different types of stress. Uh, for example, with pipe stress, it's important to understand how the pipe supports are reacting to the, the forces from the piping. So Definitely. so very often that's like two different disciplines, uh, but in stress man, that is something typically one engineer does alone, or if it's a big project, he does it with another person. But they communicate very, very closely to get all the benefits that we can have from this. And that's something we're going to talk more about today. So so that was my intent back then and, and still is for the future. So and I mean, stress has grown it's a, a lot. It's of offshore system, uh, well, subsea yeah, exactly. system, actually. So, a subsea system, yeah. So, is that so we do a lot of subsea. A lot of subsea, how, how much would you say? Sorry? How much would that be? Is that like a, a big chunk of your, your project work? Yeah, I would guess like subsea work is like 60-70% of our work. Mm -hmm. So 90% of our work, work is for the oil and gas sector um, in Norway and also globally. So um, most of it is subsea, then it's a lot of that is topside, like on top of the platforms, like the drilling units, FPSOs, FLNGs and so on. So, so um, so subsea is a really interesting topic. Um, maybe we can do another one on that another yeah, time. We yeah, we will. We will. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So so right now we are like 22 people in the company. So it's grown a lot over the last years. Uh, still not a super big company, but it's kind of forming. Uh, so that that's very interesting awesome. for me at least. But maybe more interesting is that we have one member on the Asma B31.3 committee. Uh, which is Juan Manuel uh, Mendes Franco. Yeah. Uh, also, he is the founder of the PSI Association. I'm going to mention a little bit more about that one in just a few seconds. Oh, and he is, and he is also... actually in the ASME uh, committee itself. In the... Yeah, in the committee oh, itself. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. So we got, we got like, uh, we can get feedback if you wonder about something. We can ask the committee ask members, yeah. and, and, and that's a very, very big benefit for us. And there is also kind of something called the process industry practices in, in the US. Um, not so common over here in, in Europe, but uh, we also have a committee member there as well. So so that's pretty cool. Yeah. And and um, we are also representing several companies uh, like like your company, Luke, Engineering Trainer. Exactly. Uh, trying to, to push the other courses as well. Um, and... and um, we are also a reseller for Dynaflow Research Group, who does a lot of make a lot of nice um, flow software. And Rilco pipe supports Neras is a induction bender, and we are also working closely with the University of South Southeastern Norway, mm. which is just basically in our backyard over here. I mean, there are already so, so many topics passing by. I I would love to have a discussion about induction bending and, and what that is yeah. all about. <laughs> I, I don't know that much about it myself, actually. Uh, I always like those discussions because they, they are there are so many myths in the market about the induction bends. And it's always good to have these discussions and then getting feedback directly from the people watching. I think that would be super cool to do. We did it live a couple of times in Singapore. Mm. Um, so, so that was a lot of very vivid discussion going back and forth, uh, not going into that right now, but, uh, I think I have a picture in a couple of slides where we actually burst the pipe just to prove our points. All right. 
And then most of, as I said, most of the clients we have is from the uh, oil and gas business. Yeah. So the PSI association, which was started by Juan, it's a association for pipe stress engineers. So if you're not a member, I would sign up right away. It's, it's free of charge. It's a nonprofit organization. And before the COVID, they had several events, like like uh, real events where we invited people in the different cities. We gather, we got what they call it, like um, sponsors. So so it was like full dinners. Is it like global drink. or? or, or, or... Yeah, yeah, it's global. Hmm. So. So we have associates in different um, in different countries like Nigeria, South Africa, India, uh, Spain, oh, and of wow. course Norway, yeah. um, Houston, uh, Juan's Houston, Houston of course, yeah. Mexico. So so it, it's starting to form as a big global organization. And why when the when the virus is gone, hopefully we can be having more of these kind of uh, events. You know, yeah. where we invite a lot of people. And we have topics that is related to pipe stress, but sometimes also topics related to totally different things like engineers and how to mingle, you know, <laughs> most engineers are quite introverts. So that was like one of the topics and it got really good feedback. Oh, so that's interesting. Yeah. yeah, and it's just a nice place to go and, and, and meet new people, meet common peers in the, in the industry. All right. So what is the website? PSI that side is uh, the PSI association .org. Dot org it is. All right. down here. Yeah. Just to mention, just to show our diversity, the diversity is that we are going to have like Juan, he's going to have a uh, speech at the 21st uh, American LNG forum in February. And I'm just mentioning this because we managed to get a discount. If somebody wants to attend, uh, it's a live event in, in Houston. So he will be, be talking there as well. I, I will try to uh, get, get him uh, on board for one of the live streams of Engineering Trainer just to talk about PSI and, and uh, uh, what they're doing. Exactly. And he's also going to be a co-host of, um, of the pipe stress course that we're going to run in exactly. February and March. And, and, and that's the, the, that's the nice thing about the course. It's, it's going to be, uh, me, Juan and Jonah, and, and the, the three of us has very different backgrounds. So that is, that is something I think is going to be very interesting because I'm always been into the very small details of pipe stress, all the difficult scenarios. Juan has been more on the very big scale projects where they have tens of tens of uh, engineers just working with pipe stress, for example. So. So um, it's a big diversity yeah. uh, among our yeah. engineers. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I myself am also coming from like like a very specialistic company, you know, and and uh, mm -hmm. the the broader EPC perspective is is like uh, somewhat different in the way they work and mm. the way they prepare their work, etc. But uh, we'll we'll get to that later. Yeah. Yeah. So as I said, we are global basically we have um, offices in norway usa and mexico and we also got some some people working for us without their own nice office yet but uh in in uh, california in tabasco nigeria india that's that's really cool awesome, yeah. and and we used to call or oh, we still call it the stressman academy that we had over in singapore at least once a year sometimes twice a year which is the same course as you mentioned as the um, the pipe stress course. So so uh, that is the but classroom now it, one in Singapore, right? That was the classroom one, yeah, exactly. So I was flying into Singapore, Korea, different places in Asia. We hosted it, so but mostly in Singapore. So that that that's we got a lot of context there. So that's really nice. Yeah. And and then uh, for the academy, we also now have like this this. Uh, relationship with you at engineering trainers so now we are basically right. global yeah 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 we're basically integrating or, or implement onboarding the stressman academy onto to engineering trainer.com when it comes to all the online uh, products yeah exactly so so in stressman we've been doing like 300 projects in the past 10 years we are exactly 10 years now so so um and it's kind of um exponential growth in the number of projects so it can be anything from simple hand calculation to extremely complex uh, FEA analysis. And as you asked about how much mm -hmm. was for a subsea, so 90% is oil and gas, and I guess like 70% of that is, is subsea. 
Awesome, yeah. Into too much of the details there. Pictures is usually nicer. So we've been working on he heavy lifts of ships, uh, subsea analysis, as you already mentioned, where we look at the entire system as one. And we're going to talk more about that in a few seconds. Um, we do CFD, for example. Um, yeah, detailed analysis of subsea manifolds, drilling risers. So I'm just showing this just to give a little bit of different uh, th that that you can see that we are doing different stuff. It's not only piping, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I here is the the, the uh, pipe that we bursted. 1,300 bar is a duplex pipe that was induction bent, and the extra dust is thinner than the burst area over here. Oh. So that was a very, very, very quick version of it. And, and just the other thing is that, oh, but it's not symmetrical. It should be symmetrical, right? The only force or the only load here is the pressure. So, but it was due to the mill, the mill tolerance was more on this side than, than over here. So that's, that's why it was yielding over here first. Yeah. And, and but this was the, a band that was induction banded or, or is it? Yeah, it was hot induction banded. As you can see here, this has a little bit different color because it's been heating up bent and, and cool down. All right. So so that's that's something that we use a lot of time on because we, we use these bends for, for subsea applications. All right, yeah, awesome. Yeah. I think I'll just skip quickly through them. It's it's just some pictures of um, of uh, some pipe stress models. I was thinking since there is pipe stress people here, they like to see some models. This one we'll talk more about. Um, yeah, this one too. So water hammer effects. You have a course on that, uh, Luke. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. Crazy. We have a free one actually. So I yeah. would recommend everybody <laughs> to to check it out. Yeah, it's like one and a half mm -hmm. hours discussing the concepts of of water hammer. Yeah. Yeah. So so this was a water hammer problem where they were seeing some support sliding off the of the beams they were resting on because of the water hammer effects. Mm. So the task here was like how slowly do they need to close down the valve not to generate that that kick in the line all right Pepsi right. manifold uh it looks simple but we used three and a half thousand hours on this one but it was like from concept to to the final product and we did fba of every single component here because it was custom everything is custom okay it's 900 bar design pressure wow what what thicknesses are we talking about in such pipes uh 40 50 millimeters of super duplex okay in, and the biggest in a diameter of diameter it's uh the biggest one was 12 inch uh in the diameter it's a custom pipe as well it's not like a typical yeah. nominal pipe size um pipe so so the id was uh, in a diameter was uh, 12 inches um on, on parts of it and then 10 inches on the on the smaller part over here yeah hence hence yeah. the fea because i mean it's not always uh, thin piping then mm, sorry hence the the, the fea part the finite yeah. element analysis because it's not always you know uh, considered as as thin piping mm -hmm. so so we had to do every single component here was as i said detailed calculated that, that's also a very interesting topic uh that you had touching in the course, not, not in details, but just giving a brief overview. Just another type of subsea manifolds. And people are wondering why are these, these pipes so long is to, to have a lot of flexibility. Because this green area over here, it's where you connect to the next uh, subsea module. Um, and when you, when you mount it subsea, it's never gonna fit perfectly. So you might have to lift it 100 millimeters and push ah. it sideways another 50. So it, it needs a lot of flexibility to hook it up. Yeah. That's that's why you have the flex loops going out like this. Yeah, yeah. I once uh, once saw those and they were called elephant ears. People call <laughs> them elephant ears. I, I like the term. Yeah, that's a nice terminology. Yeah. Detailed calculation of components, as I mentioned, uh, calculating the stress intensification factors and so on. Um, to, to ease the number of analyzes in the system. Yeah. That was like our background. Um, took a little bit more time since you were asking questions. Uh, <laughs> no worries. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so that is our background in stress, man. And um, uh, you still can see my screen, I hope. Yeah. 
So the topic of today, as we talked about before we went live, is uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, pipe supports um, and how how the different loads are kind of uh, against each other, uh, working against each other, what happens when you put a gap in, in the system and, 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 and friction and, and the stiffness of the structural steel. All right, so, I mean, I see a lot. So primary loads, uh, secondary, yeah, I think that is a very interesting topic, right? Primary versus secondary. And then, then also, you know, yeah. the question we get asked a lot is like, why do you, instead of, you know, adding like a load case that considers the temperature, why do you subtract prim uh, the, the sustained load case from the from the uh, operating load case, et cetera? Mm -hmm. So uh, I would love to dig into that, yeah. Yes, and that, that's what we're going to talk about now. And um, as you say, uh, the primary loads, they want low flexibility. Let's say if you have a very long flexible line and you have, big, have a big valve or some, some mass on it, it will collapse under its own weight. Um, so you need to start supporting it. But the second you start supporting it, it will counteract the thermal growth of the pipe. So if it's a hot pipe, it wants to expand in different directions, yeah. all depending on the on the layout of the pipe. So so that is going to be acting against the uh, usually against uh, the um, pipe support that you add into the system. Yeah, yeah. It's a, like so, it's like a balance. Like when it comes to uh, flexibility you want to keep everything as flexible as possible so that it can expand etc but when it comes to vibrations and dynamic effects you basically want to uh, put it all into concrete you know it can't vibrate and, and, and there's <laughs> exactly. a balance somewhere when it comes to supporting exactly no, that's a good way of putting it uh, so so because you don't usually you don't want low natural frequency you want them as high as possible yeah. it depends of course a bit on your equipment and so on but but uh, in the case that we're going to talk about now, there was some very strong uh, triplex pumps that are uh, used for, for uh, the drilling systems. And they have a low RPM. Uh, I think they have like 120 strokes per minute. That gives them a, a um, uh, what do you call it, a pulsation uh, frequency. The lowest one is 6 hertz mm -hmm. because they had three pistons in them. Um, so, so we're going to talk more about that. And, and what was actually found in the case that we're looking at, it was found vibration in that case. So we needed to add more supports, but then we were getting too high nozzle loads, for example, or high, too high secondary stresses. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and also, I think it, we just start with that topic. It, it's, it, sorry, not topic, but the case, because it's easier when you have something to point at. Exactly. So as I said, this is a drilling system on a offshore uh, drilling rig where we got involved because you can see my mouse pointer, right? Yeah, yeah it's moving around over here. So uh, in this area where I'm trying to kind of uh, highlight, it was a lot of vibrations. I will show some, some pictures of that. But uh, over here, it was a lot of vibration. That was why they contacted us in the first place. And, and we started to dig into this problem. And since it's a high pressure mud system, it, it is uh, quite heavy wall thickness on the pipes as well. It's very stiff, very stiff system. So, so the pressure here is like 690 bars on some line, lines and 1,035 bars on different lines. Temperatures, the same is, is uh, 121 degrees Celsius and 177 degrees Celsius. But what is most interesting is not two extreme temperature ranges here, but what is interesting here is the, the wall thickness. As, as you can see, it's five inch line with 1.2 inch wall thickness. Yeah. There's almost no opening in the middle of it. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> so, well, of course there is some subflow area, but still it's really thick wall pipes. So this, these pipes are very, very stiff. And, 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 and also what is flowing vents. is mud. So, so that is like, uh combination of yeah, liquid it's... and, and, and uh, solids, but is it like a yeah. steady stream or, or like more like a two-phase flow? You can have a little bit of two-phase flow during startup and shutdown. Um, but in this case, the, it was the pulsations out of the, the mud pumps that were, was, mm. was 
uh, yeah. making the, the, the vibration, the yeah, force, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, for yeah, the oscillation, the force wasn't too high. So, so, um, so then uh, it became this, uh, yeah, and also that, the, as you can see, the, the bends are a bit long radius. I think it's 3D bends, but they are double back bends. So they are, they have a double thickness in the bend due to erosion problems because you, it's eroding fast when you have this, this um, solids in, in the flow. So, so that makes it even stiffer uh, than, than usual. And then we, we have the flexibility versus natural frequency battle. It's like we need flexibility, but at the same time, we need as high stiffness as possible. Yeah. So the initial, initial problem, as I said, it was extensive vibrations. The secondary problems that occurred after we started uh, playing around with the systems, and there was also some, some initial problems with the, um, with the initial analysis that we didn't perform, so, so we had to kind of redo everything. Um, so, but this was a build system, right? It was ready when this you was, got Yeah, that's, that's a very good point here. That, that is a very good point. This, is a, this was a built system. They called us after everything was built, pressure tested, ready to go, uh, and we shipped yeah. out. So, so it was uh, crucial for them, not that we didn't start changing the pipe routing as well. Yeah, exactly. Because starting to cut open these pipes again means that you need to do all the, those those things again, the, the 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 testing. So and 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 it would be very very expensive to go in there and say, oh, I just need an expansion loop over here, for example. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was something we should try to avoid, and we we managed to to have the pipe routing the same. We didn't change the pipe. We had to change some of the supports. So so um, when we started looking into it, we found also very high nozzle loads, at least compared to what was specified by the vendors of the equipment. All right. Um, so when, when we did this, a very typical workflow, because as I said, these pipes are very stiff. And when we did the initial screening, where we assumed that the pipe supports were uh, like rigid, like normal, you know, you add the, the, the um, direction the pipe support is, yeah, is yeah, acting. Yeah, yeah. Um, we had frequencies that didn't show us any major problems. So, but then we started looking into it, and we see that the supports are quite slender. <laughs> if you see, it, you mean the structure, very much right? The, the, the now. structure, yeah, like the structure, the yeah. yeah, the structure of the pipe support, not the not the clamp of the pipe support itself, but the structure that holds the support, yeah. yeah. So, so you can see, for example, this one here. Uh, it was two meter tall. So, so what are we looking very, at here, Sondra? These are the structures. Yeah, these are the structures. Is uh, in we modeled them in a software called SAP two thousand, which is structural software like Stad Pro and Sax. Okay, I don't know it. Yeah. So, so we we modeled them in there, um, and we modeled them closer together because it doesn't really matter where they are in space because we are taking out the stiffness of the supports, and we are we are adding the loads from the analysis to it. So. So, but as you can see, some some of them are very very slender. Um, so they are that means that they're very soft. Yeah, yeah, especially you know super. since it's such a stiff system. Mm -hmm. So so we 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 were anyway gonna calculate all the pipe supports in the project. So so uh, we we did that first. We calculated all of them, the stiffness of all of them, and then we took that stiffness into Caesar 2. Yeah. You could also use the structural modeler in, in Caesar 2. Yeah, yeah I, was, I was gonna uh, ask, like, why did you choose mm -hmm. to do it uh, like this? Instead of modeling the actual uh, frame into the pipe stress model. We, we were gonna do uh, code checking of each member afterwards. There is some code checking in Caesar 2 for members, I think, mm -hmm. uh, but it's according to the American standards. Uh, we were going to do it in accordance with the European. So it was automatically, um, um, what do you call it? Automatically um, code checked uh, in in uh, SEP 2000 in accordance with Euro code. Yeah. And, and in in North Sea, uh, for example, we have something called NORSOC, which is an extra set of rules um, that is applicable to everything we do. Um, so it might be, for example, when it's structural steel, it might be a higher material factor than the regular ones used for buildings onshore, oh, for example. Yeah. So it might be more additional safety factors. It might be uh, stating of the loads. 
and that that is all found in the Norsoc um, uh, regulations. But that is a Norwegian code, right? For Norwegian. Uh, That's a Norwegian uh, code, yeah, for for the offshore business here in Norway. Mm -hmm. And I uh, see several companies around the globe is actually adapting also some of some of those codes into their their um, designs. All right. So so um, we were calculating each of the supports, getting the, the stiffness. Just ran a simple model analysis in CCP2 to check the frequencies. And it went a little bit down, but still it shouldn't be a problem with regards to the uh, vibration that we, they saw in the system. Uh, so we continued and we did the bus pulse calculation. You know bus pulse. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Pretty good. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's uh, just to give some clarification. Bus pulse is a software package provided by Dynaflow Research Group that allows uh, engineers to do pulsation studies in piping systems. It's actually pretty mm -hmm. neat. You 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 model the uh, the compressor, and and then you can calculate the acoustic resonance in the piping system. So. Um, uh, yeah, those are those are very interesting calculations. Yeah. Yeah. So so we did that, and we did a harmonic analysis in CSO two afterwards just to see the resonance, and still we couldn't see much. Okay. So yeah, here here's just a picture from from uh, Bus Pulse, um, the model that we took from CSO two and we inserted into Bus Pulse. This is just a small area of the model, but it was in this area where we had a problem. Yeah. So. So, so we got the data from bus pulse um, and basically uh, what these loads is saying are peak to peak force. That's the unbalanced force in the system. So in this case, we had 9,000 Newtons as the peak to peak force, but you don't need much force if you hit the natural frequency. Yeah, yeah. So that was what was happening here. Yeah. It was, it was shaking uh, quite a lot. I mean, maybe interesting to, to elaborate on this plot a little bit more to to make sure that people understand what they are seeing mm -hmm. basically what this shows yeah. is like the piping system and and then what boss pulse does is you have a compressor that that gives little pressure fluctuations instead of a yeah perfectly it's, it's, constant it's a, one, right it's a, a pump yeah yeah oh, a pump, so, right. so the, the, the mud pump is is giving pressure fluctuations or, or pressure pulsations yeah. in the system and, and those and are they travel with the speed if, if they resonate Exactly, but and they travel with the speed of sound through the system. Um, so the speed of sound of the of the content and, and um, the stiffness of the system. Yeah, yeah. And <clears throat> sorry, uh, and and the longer usually between the bends, the higher that force will be. It's very very close between the bends, then the signal hasn't moved that much. Um, it doesn't take much time to to move from one to the other. Then the loads will be lower. So. Yeah. So this is um, this is basically the software. What is does that was ma our main purpose here for us was to get the loads out of the system. The software can do a lot of other stuff as well. Yeah. That was like what we really needed from from the analysis. So we got one question, Sandra, from from uh, Umar. I think that's an interesting one to note. I mean, just to make sure, there there were no spring hangers in the system, right? Because it's very good question. Yeah. Perfect. I actually had it on my notebook to mention spring hangers. Um, yeah, uh, it, it was no spring hangers. That's, that's, there was, there was non spring hangers in this system. Um, but I wanted to mention the spring hangers uh, since he asked, I think it's a good time to mention it. Um, spring hangers typically have a very, very low, uh, stiffness, at least compared with regular supports and the piping system itself. So, so my experience is that adding a spring hanger to the calculation doesn't really change the dynamical response of the system. Mm, because the system but, was so much stiffer. Yeah, so if, if, if you had, for example, a, a system with a lot of spring hangers and you have a dynamic load on that, that typically is a problem. And they, for example, in the North Sea for the offshore projects, they are saying avoid spring hangers at all costs and uh to this day i haven't seen yeah i've seen a few spring hangers on some well heads um that's true uh, but other than that i haven't really seen spring hangers used that much offshore because they don't want these vibrational problems yeah i can imagine you need corrosion. to find a workaround 
would also hmm? i can imagine corrosion would also you know being offshore since it's, it's a mechanical part you know that might move i don't know i, I would uh, i understand yeah the, i understand their perspective mm -hmm. right so so then as i said we tried to do all of these things and still it didn't vibrate much everything looked fine in the analysis but when you looked at it on site, um, it was vibrating with half a diameter. And as I said, these, wow. these pipes are very stiff. Oh, half a lot. diameter vibration yeah. is quite a lot. Yeah. So, so what, we, uh, what we started to do was to, to, to uh, play the what if game. It's like, what if that support is not there? What would happen? What if this support is not there? What would happen? Because it was clearly something we couldn't understand the system and we didn't have access to the system itself ah. it was it was far away so oh, it's a, like not so, not like mitigation measure but like understanding like uh, what is going on in the field yeah exactly because i always like to have a benchmark model especially with dynamical problems to to be able to generate the the vibration in your analysis then you know that you have a good benchmark model so exactly. what we ended up with was that we, we thought that two supports over here, it wasn't welded. It was saying in the drawings that they were supposed to be welded. But when we looked at the, um, uh, well, when, I, when we asked the, the guys on the, on the fabrication yard to, to go out and take a look, it turned out the supports was there, but it, it wasn't welded to the structure. Mm -hmm. It was just acting as a rest support. Yeah, exactly. It was just sliding back and forth. Uh, it didn't. It didn't stop that motion that they were supposed to be stopping. So, so we we found that okay in our analysis it was showing roughly half a di diameter of of vibration uh, at around those frequencies where they were observing it when they were testing the system. So that gave us a very good benchmark of the system. Yeah. Now we know that we have a system that we can start to to tackle. You know, start to 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 work on. Yeah. So, so the 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 customer did like vibration measurements or, or anything like that? No, they just went out there with their phones. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like <laughs> estimation of the of the displacements and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, but but the thing was to get rid of those vibrations. Yeah. Um, so so uh, it was a very unscientific way of doing it, um, but it was a rough estimate at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We done the same with subsea piping as well. The problem, some, and sometimes you can put like a if you take it into one of the movie um, uh, editors, you can start to track pixels. Yeah. And if you know have any relationship like the diameter, you know exactly how big the diameter is. Yeah. Then you can know that one pixel equals yeah. X number of millimeter. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've done those. So, so then we've been yeah. tracking the vibrations up and down, and that's really interesting. But for subsea, that is sometimes impossible because you got fishes. So the fish is swimming in between the camera and the vibration. Oh, so you but cannot they, see the they do the make time. recordings. They do go uh, with a camera. Yeah. Oh. So so that is that is really nice to see. Uh, there's a lot of cod fish here in Norway, so it's not that easy to see it all the time. So. <laughs> yeah. So so that was like the initial problem. Why is it vibrating? The analysis showed that it shouldn't be vibrating. We figured out, okay, it's in that area. Um, that it had some problems, and also several of the supports had quite a lot of gaps in them um, due to that uh, the first analysis showed that it would have a lot of uh, thermal expansion stresses in those areas. So, so they added gaps, and we're going to talk about gaps soon. Yeah. But, um, but that also made it very, um, what do you call it uh, in English, uh, easy to shake, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> rattling. We we got one so, question like from um, from Kandarp. I think that's that's a question, an interesting question as well. I mean, if you include the structural parts into Caesar or any uh, pipe stress software, um, it would typically include. That's why you would. That's why you do it in the first place. Include the stiffness of these structures. That the whole. That's the whole reason for doing it. And then you connect the piping with the structures using a C node. You know, mm -hmm. using the the. Uh, the, the directions of freedom that you want to you know connect both uh, yes and, and then you put anchors in the structures where, where they are fixed so, so that's typically how we do it but in your case you used the stiffness that you got from an other software a, a structural calculation mm -hmm. software and you added them into the 
uh, the pipe supports, right? Yes. Yeah. All right. Okay. That is true. So, so we were extracting, uh, as I said, the reason why we did it in a different software was to get the code check of the of the each of the beam elements easily. Okay. Yes, and and um, then uh, we started looking into the models that we got. Um, and there were several companies who worked on this system and they chopped it up. Uh, for example, here, if you see my mouse pointer again, yeah. it was just an anchor there. And I asked them, okay, is there an anchor there? No, but that's kind of where it's a penetration through the decks uh, or through the wall. So that's our end of scope. That's our scope, you know, yeah. it's up to here. Yeah. And then the other company who modeled it, they continue to model up to this area over here. So it was like, both companies put an anchor on it, and I'm like, you, but you cannot do that, especially when you're looking at vibrations, for example. You need the entire picture of it. You need to go from one end to the other end, or or you just need to agree on, let's have an anchor over here, and, and that's a good a good clean cut between the two analyzers. Yeah. But it was it was like a, a crossing through like a deck or something you mentioned. Was it a fixed point? Was it respect? No, no, no. It wasn't a fixed point at all. Um, it wasn't at all so so we removed that and that also changed the behavior quite a lot yeah. uh, of the system of course and then we modeled everything into into one model um, because we started to see that these kind of assumptions then they made uh, incorrect values on the nozzles so yeah so this is like a um, a high pressure mud um, no sorry choke and kill manifold all right and this uh, actually belongs to a different project where the task was to calculate the manifold itself um but it's, it's very detailed and as you can see most of them all the green stuff here that's like rigid joints so all the rigid joints are um actually with some stiffness in them because it's not 100 percent stiff these these valves so so um it's a little bit hard modeling... to see some so if I understand it correctly, you you have like a Caesar model and you um, have a uh, like a visual of the actual system combined. Yes. And, and yes, and that is very correct. There are a lot of valves in there, and and all those yes. valves are represented by the green rigids. Exactly. Okay. So this is basically what we can see here. For example, there, here is a more simplified version of it. If you see my mouse pointer yeah. and flip it to the to the left. Um, so yeah you can see this this part over here is actually this this one in details if you if you're calculating every single detail flange leak at each flange and so on so um so it, but in the analysis um yeah here we go uh this is the manifold connections you can see that the piping is coming in here to different nozzles yeah. of that equipment and yeah, sorry, I see some of the flanges has been marked as, as uh, valves as well. They're supposed to be flanges. But um, when I enter here, and you can see it looks like there is an anchor here, but it's it's not really. It's just a C-node, as you just mentioned yeah. earlier. Uh, we'll talk more about C-nodes later on. Um, it's just to, to be able to extract the loads on the nozzles in these areas. It's, it's much simpler than going into the element loads. You can just go to the restraint loads. Yeah. And take out the loads. Yeah, exactly. So, so what what is happening here is that, as I said, the temperature range is uh, on some of the pipes 121 degrees Celsius, on some other pipes uh, 177 degrees Celsius, 250, 350 uh, Fahrenheit. And the thing is that, and there you, you can also see these red ones here. That's actual supports, but that supports that we have calculated the stiffness of as well. Oh, yeah um but um what we often see is that people tend to set an anchor where i have my mouse pointer on the vertical stretch here yeah. vertical uh stretch here as well and here and here they tend to have anchors there and i've been asking people why do they do that and they're like no I, they want to shield the manifold from the external loads all right but uh, as I just said, the, te the design temperature here, it's up to 177 degrees Celsius. Ah. So this manifold, it will 
expand you know uh, the support so if you try to hold it here <laughs> you get very very high loads on these nozzles yeah. and it's not the external piping that is the problem then it is the um okay. expansion in the manifold yeah. Yeah. but a lot of a lot of uh, uh, times i see that um people is adding an anchor here and they stop the analysis here so they put the pipe up to here and they stop mm. same here here and here but don't then you don't get the expansion in your manifold yeah. and that goes for all kind of equipment as, as you know as well it's for example if you have a tank or a vessel pressure vessel that is uh, hot it will be expanding maybe vertically if it's a vertical vessel then it will be expanding vertically and gradually and you need to take that into account of your calculation the same thing goes for these manifolds as you see here it's all made of steel it will all expand and and generate thermal loads on on these flanges here yeah i have an, I have an interesting question from brandon thanks brandon for for uh, you know uh, taking part in the discussion he's asking about um expansion joints like like uh, what is the advantage of using pipe anchors versus expansion joints for, for this kind of mm. thermal expansion what's your take on that yeah um expansion joints would be working but this is 690 bar uh oh. 10,000 psi yeah. so it's difficult to find any expansion joints that would actually work with this application yeah and, and what is what is is it commonly used in offshore expansion joints no that's also something we try really to to avoid yeah, that's, that's um it. Then we rather get a good pipe routing than using the expansion joints. Right. But I see also that I also see that the expansion joints get better and better and better. So, like metallic expansion joints, uh, spoke with some people that are producing that, and and based on their tests, they become really good. So, so it might also be a little bit like um, old myths uh, in the market as well about the benefits and the and the um, disadvantages of using expansion joints. I, I've seen some pretty corroded ones, you know, in, in mm -hmm. like pretty old systems. So I'm a, I'm a little bit uh, hesitant. I could, I understand the hesitation. Let me put it that way for offshore system with, with all the corrosion proneness, but uh, mm -hmm. no. Yes. So, so as I said, um, earlier on um the problem here was to find like the the balancing point between high stiffness and enough flexibility yeah and and what we ended up doing was to change we, we looked at what we had what was already built and we started looking at each and one of the supports can we remove a support to add flexibility to the system or can we change the support functions to kind of uh, get a little bit more flexibility, but at the same time retain some of the stiffness. Yeah, yeah. So, so that was the main challenge of this project here. And and what I usually do when I'm when I'm doing, especially new projects. Uh, in this case, we were very locked in on. We couldn't change the routing. They said to us, if you need to add supports, please as few as possible. Um, if you want to remove supports, no problem. That's easy. It was all bolted, so you could just take them away again. Um, but but what I try to do every time when I start a new project, well, first of all, I shut off my computer and I sit and I print out the ISOs first before I shut it down. And then I, I'm looking at the system as, as a system and thinking what will be the main loads, how will they act, where, how, how will the uh, temperature um, expansion look like, how will... I will uh, acceleration affect the system and so on. And I kind of try to draw the lines by myself yeah. uh, on paper because that kind of primes the brain. That is good common practice. I mean, uh, I, I, I didn't always do that, I have to admit. Yeah, so, so when I've done that, sometimes in the beginning of a project, I don't set up all the load cases at once because that's a lot of information to dig through. I set up, uh, for example, just pure thermal expansion, pure weight for example just to see what would happen uh, or how does it want to move in the model yeah. and where you have not much thermal expansion uh what do you call it uh where you don't have so much movement of the thermal expansion 
that could be a good play, uh, point to place a support. Yeah, yeah. Um, so so um, I'm always trying to, to, to look at it from a very simple perspective at first. And then when I start to feel that I know the system, I know how it's going to react to the different types of loads, then I build all the load cases. But in the beginning, is typically I might just add, for example, if I know there is a blast load in the system, just add the blast load, see what happens, yeah. um, and then and then accelerations, for example, just see how how much stresses did that yield, and and it might not be the real values that I get out, but still, it's a it's a a way to get to know your system, especially those those uh, ones that you anticipate to be the critical ones, like blast loading mm -hmm. and, and stuff mm -hmm. like that, yeah. Exactly. So, so that's um, and, and for example, then you can see that where you have the most um, movement due to the blast load. If you put a support exactly at that point, that is probably going to be the best point to to support yep. uh, for the blast load. And then you need to take a look at the uh, thermal expansion uh, deflection, and and maybe there's a lot of thermal dis displacement in the same area. Then you might have a problem with your thermal expansion stress. Yeah. So so it's like this finding this. Um... So you do this like you, you do this before. You, like what what I always used to do is take a piece of paper and and just start defining the load cases. Mm -hmm. You know, but but it's interesting to hear that you start with you know about you know having a look at the loads and then the possible you know responses of the system, the displacements. Mm -hmm. And, and and through that you know reasoning go to setting up the load cases yeah and, and probably the load cases if i set it up afterwards or before it would be the same but still um that that's just my way of thinking and as, yeah. as you're saying there's several ways to get to this to the to the answer here but i always believed very strongly in in um uh really thinking through the problem before you're jumping all, all over it you know yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, yeah. uh and it doesn't take that much time either. Just running a few cases quickly to see, especially when you've done it a few times, you see that, okay, that happens, that happens. And, and you already predicted that it would happen, but then you get some numbers that that confirms it. Maybe the stresses are super low due to the wave acceleration, for example. Then um, then that's not going to be any of your concern. You know, you don't need to add a lot of guide supports if the if it's not that move much movement sideways for example yeah. Yeah. so so that that's just the way I'm, I'm doing it and and um and i will try to take out some uh pictures and i can put them in in um in the in the linkedin forum where we have this discussion uh just to show a little bit more of that yeah. so uh the lessons learned from this system was that flexibility is all not always but it's very often uh, fighting against the natural frequency. You want to have a high natural frequency, but that means low flexibility and vice versa. Yeah, what, what were the natural frequencies for this system? Like, uh, any indication? This system had a natural frequency of, um, in the beginning, when we started looking at it, 6.9 hertz. All right, so and below 10, which, which uh, yeah. And we managed to get it up to around 9 hertz as the, as the lowest one. Mm -hmm. Um, and then um, what we told the owner of this system then, it was like, okay, you could probably push it up by adding more supports to it, but uh, that would be very costly for them. It was easier for them just to run another test on it and, and see that, okay, now the vibration that we saw earlier on, it's gone. So, um, yeah, and it was like we had to include the structural stiffness to get the right response of the, of the system. So we calculated the structural stiffness of each of the pipe supports, or as you said, Luke, we can use a structural steel um, modeler in, in CSO2 or, or different software like Triflex, for example. I know there we are often modeling the structural steel directly in the model. Yeah. And connecting it through C nodes or connection, no, sorry, release elements, as it's called there. So, so there is different ways of doing it. Um, and then uh, don't add fictional anchors. People call them fictional anchors. I feel they're just bogus because I've seen it in several projects. It's like, okay, this box is our scope of work. Outside that, we don't care. And then on the on the boundary, several people put a fictional anchor. 
Okay, so, so these like are that. anchors that, that are only in the model and have nothing to do only with the model. The only in people's system. mind and they say, okay, it's very little lows on the anchor, but how do they know that the other people thought about it as well, you know? So I, I seen some very bad yeah. mistakes there. That doesn't um, make sense, yeah. yeah. It doesn't make sense. And also it, it's, even though you see it's low loads over there, for example, you cannot calculate the correct natural frequency of the system, especially if you're, the area you're looking for is close to that fictional anchor. Yeah, I would say I would say for uh, especially for dynamic analysis, you know, such such non-existing anchors, putting them in your model is is uh, like r really bad practice. I mean, but even for static analysis, you know, you have to include some type of continuation and influence of, of parts outside your scope, see how they mm -hmm. interact with your sections. But uh, mm -hmm. especially for dynamics, dynamic analysis, such anchors will change everything. Yeah. And then always confirm the boundaries. We, we see this not only on this project, I also got one phone one time when we had one phone call when, when we had a, uh, a FPS so with a 30 inch line that was moving. And the, the guy on the other end said, he's moving 30 centimeters. And like 30 centimeters, like 300 millimeters. Yeah, 24 inch line. <laughs> and I was like, it cannot do that. That's that's dangerous. <laughs> so they had shut it down, of course. Um, and I looked into our model. We had three to four millimeters with with uh, it was slug flow that was driving this motion. And and I was checking it out. I was adjusting the loads, and the maximum I could get was like maybe three four millimeters of displacement in my model. Yeah. And then I told them go out there and you take pictures of each and one of the supports. And and most of the supports were just rest supports. They weren't. The anchors wasn't there, the guidance uh, wasn't there, so so then the line was moving quite a lot. Yeah. But it was a very interesting one. It was the same thing. Uh, and we see it's a bit, uh, sometimes uh, when we made the pipe stress calculation, we handed it over to the structural, sorry, not structural, but we handed it over to, yeah, the structural pipe support guys, and they're supposed to put it in there. And they even drawn the correct, the drawings are correct, but it's not executed correctly. Um, so, so, so that's always very important yeah. to confirm those boundaries. Yeah, they, I mean, uh, I've done a few like uh, uh, exp inspections, like whenever, you know, the, the, the situation allowed it. There's a lot of practicalities in there, but, you know, it's really great to, you know, analyze the system and then seeing it r straight afterwards. And, and, you know, you work so many hours on it, you just walk around there and see, you know, hey, this is other, other different than what I intended and this is correct. Mm -hmm. and, but I mean, uh, it can save you a lot of a lot of problems. Uh, yeah. Forward. The only problem is that usually when we do the analysis, it's it's uh, being produced somewhere far away. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. it's difficult to go out on field and, and take a look. Um, but having people at least take some pictures, or or and they should do this. It's it's part of the as build. So I don't understand why it's sometimes happening. But I think it's it's uh, so important to to just know that. We even had a project where the the people mounting the pipes they felt like oh it needs a pipe support over here it needs a pipe support over here so adding pipe supports killing our flexibility yeah so so uh, there is a lot of reasoning usually behind the pipe stress analysis yeah I I got one uh, interesting question from uh, from Ash um, mm -hmm. first of all thanks Ash for for joining the discussions. Um, like in this system, uh, Sandra, you took a lot of effort to have a look at the at the model, or sorry, at the supports, their stiffnesses, etc. Um, but you don't always do that, right? I mean, um, no. Uh, Good question. They, as well. they are it... standardized. Like this, the pipes, the pipe shoes, uh, sorry, mm -hmm. the, the supports are standardized. Um, yeah. What is your take on that? Yeah. No. By by all means, we don't do it this detailed every single time we do a pipe stress analysis then we wouldn't get anything done <laughs> but but in in special cases like when you have very thick walled pipe that is very stiff then uh, and then it's natural to take at least a look at uh, at the structural drawings of the of the pipe support structures yeah. if they look very slender put them into the model see what happens if they are really beefy and and strong no problem they they're probably strong enough I don't have like a rule of thumb on this, but let's say if you're supporting a 
uh, two inch pipe with, with low wall thickness it doesn't have much stiffness and you connect that to a hollow section for example it's probably going to be totally fine um and 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 but the, the bigger pipe the stronger it's going to be it was like that project that I, I mentioned uh when i was showing uh the portfolio earlier uh, the 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 very high pressure one in that one the piping was stronger than the support structure around it oh wow yeah because because the beams were like really strong beams but in in certain directions in the, in the weak axis of the beams the piping was taking most of the load not the structure below it but but that was how we designed it anyway but uh in that case it was so important to get the structural stiffness of the of the main main structure yeah i mean um uh, i have a couple of questions which might be worth uh, just running uh, running by um we were talking over like we're, we're one hour in the session so uh, yeah i see that <laughs> uh, i mean time flies but uh we'll just see if we we can touch some other topics or um how to progress let's let's ha have a few discuss a few of these questions so um one notifications that that uh corrode corrado uh, sorry uh, gave which is an interesting statement i think is to include support settlement if needed and i mean um i as i understand it you know uh, if supports move separate from thermal expansion or any movement from mm -hmm. of your pipe itself you, you include those as a like displacement on a c note yeah. on that support um mm -hmm. i mean that's a good that's a valid point i don't think it's valid for this case as as you know it's all no. offshore there's no settlement of ground or, or uh, yeah it, 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 it's it's actually settlement uh, off the ground in offshore all the time because the offshore structure they are a bit flexible okay but then the so whole structure ship... displaces right not one support mm -hmm. so in this case that we we tested out it wasn't like the driving force so we didn't pay much attention to it uh, but in, in other, let's say if you have a ship, a long, yeah. long ship, yeah. and you have a pipeline on top of that ship, it's going to be like, um, the harmonica. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, harmonica. yeah. It's, it's like yeah. a force. The accordion, the accordion. accordion. Sorry, yeah. the it's accordion. a force displacement <laughs> from the ship onto the pipe system. Mm -hmm. That's right. So, so that, that's a very interesting case. Uh, we, we've done several, uh, analyzes like that and you need to calculate the relative displacement between each of the of the pipe supports yeah. in yeah. both uh, horizontal and and vertical direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So um, one other question, which is a, is a different question, but I think it's interesting uh, one from from uh, Alin. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Alin, for for asking. How important is it for a stress engineer to know uh, the design of pipe supports? I mean. Typically, pipe stress engineers, uh, they use standards, right? Which, which have uh, um, allowable limits, allowable loads on, on the pipe uh, supports. Yeah, yeah, but that's, that's for the shoes, the pipe support shoes yeah. itself. So they, they have like this, this uh, design guidelines or, or design basis or whatever they call it, um, specifications that, as you say, they, they can go in there, you can pick out shoes that are suitable for different temperature ranges, uh, many of them have like allowable loads stated on them. So, so that that's one thing. That that's the simple part of it. But in this case, you are more talking about the structure that connects to the shoe, ah, because yeah. the shoe is like the link between the structure. Yeah, the shoe is not the, the is not is not like the the limiting part. It was the it was the structure itself. Mm, it, it, it can be, let's say you use a U-bolt, for example, yeah. and you have a lot of side sideways loads on the U-bolt, then the U-bolt might be uh, failing long time before the structural steel that it's connected to fails. I, I was actually educated in this field with, with like uh, uh, not being allowed to use U-bolts. So my pr mm -hmm. I, I, I don't have any experience with U-bolts other, other than that my, my seniors would would tell me to do it over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so I've been I've been working a lot with U-bolts actually for the offshore industry, uh, but they are usually very uh, weak in the horizontal direction. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So so another yeah, so... another uh, question we got is about the friction in this model. Mm -hmm. So so um, I mean it's a heavy pipe. Uh, how did you include that? 
Yeah, in this model, the friction wasn't so. We actually added it. It was it's this kind of Teflon uh, sliders on oh, yeah, it. Yeah. So so it's 0.1 I think we used yeah. in the model, uh, but it didn't ma didn't matter that much. We were checking it out, uh, so we were having some iterational problems due to that. Exactly. But but it's not the weight of the system. It's 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 so thick walled pipe. So. It kind of carry itself, uh, and and but the weight compared with with the expansion loads was was fairly small, yeah. and of course that also generates uh, friction. Uh, but um, uh, we we tested it with and without friction on several systems, and it didn't didn't give us much different results. All right, I I, I have experienced several projects in which. Uh you you uh, you know you had the support structure supporting arrangement correctly you know it took some iterations and but then the 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 um, mechanical eigenfrequencies of a system were still not matching with what was seen in the field and then mm -hmm. and then by looking at the friction in in several of the key supports uh, you know you could uh, um, yeah really model the the reality into your system it, it's mm -hmm. a little bit different, you know. You have to be be careful, of course, to not over model things and and thereby uh, <laughs> exactly not being able to generalize your conclusions. But but um, mm -hmm. yeah, friction can be important for those those dynamics. I uh, yes, I but it's very difficult with the, the dynamics and friction yeah. because the natural frequency that you need uh, is is based on a linear uh, what do you call it uh, stiffness matrix. Exactly, yeah. So when you add friction, which is a non-linear yeah. load, it kind of messes it up. So so you then you don't have a linear system anymore. Yeah. Same with gaps as well. You need to make a decision: is the gap closed or open yeah. when you calculate the natural frequency? Yeah. A, a workaround around that is to kind of run a time domain analysis. Caesar two cannot do it, but other software like Ansys, for example, can run time domain analysis. So then you will get the movement of the pipe until it touches the, the the gap the gap closes for example then it changes the behavior and and, and so forth so the, it's possible to model but it, it takes a lot of time to to actually set it up yeah i, I have two more questions sondra that that really um get my well Good? three more questions oh, three. um first of all uh, uh jame is asking uh, thanks for asking um what was the solution in this in this uh, uh, case, so so uh, you know you had these vibrations. Question: Maybe I didn't uh -huh. explain it good enough. Sorry. <laughs> so so the solution to the vibration, which was a main problem over in this area where I'm pointing right now, it was just basically to weld those two supports back in place, ah, and really? we changed. Yeah, <laughs> and we changed the support types on the lower part of the piping because they had five six millimeters of gaps. Um, so, so we told them, okay, use a different type of uh, of uh, pipe clamp on those that is kind of holding the pipe. It's no gaps in there. It's just clamped around it um, yeah. uh, and, and hold it still. Uh, so, so we changed uh, the supports on the bottom part here, and we, we've got them to weld this one as they were supposed to be. Yeah. Um, that was that was like the solution over here, and. Over here, where you see a lot of piping, uh, we, we were struggling with very high loads on the nozzles here uh, compared to what the allowable loads were. So in that case, we did a um, we, we, we changed uh, like some of the um, support types. For example, it's, it's a bit difficult to see on the screen probably. Uh, <laughs> this is just a rest hold on support over here. Yeah. We didn't want to have any sideways. Uh, it was a guide. And, and we said, okay, if you, we need that one to have enough uh, stiffness of the pipe, but you can remove the, the, the sideways um, uh, stoppers. And, and we made them, we made some sketches for them to, to how to make that. And it would actually work. Um, that, was, that was changed over here. Uh, we removed several of the supports in this area just to add more flexibility and still keep, and still the, the natural frequencies was was high enough and, and it didn't experience any problems after um, after running it. Yeah. And also we did FEA of, uh, here you can see, it's, this is a little bit coarser one, but uh, we did FEA of the API flanges uh, on the um, connection points. All right. 
because you got API 6AF2, that's a technical document, technical report from API, where they did FEA of a lot of uh, flanges, um, but their boundary conditions is, is quite conservative. Uh, so, so we modeled the entire flange pair, as you can see down here with the pre-tensioning, everything in place, the, the gasket, you cannot see the gas, gasket, so why, but you can why, see it. Sorry to interrupt, Sondo, why FEA? I mean, you, you uh, have this, uh... Um, equivalent pressure rule there there are the you know mm -hmm. um, Taylor and Forge methods those kind of uh, uh, calculations mm -hmm. FEA is a pretty pretty uh, detailed calculations for, for flanges like were the yeah, loads like way exceeding the the, uh, the results from the other uh, methods yeah it was mm -hmm. so the first thing we did was to kind of mimic the the original method and and we got the same answers as as what api got for for their their fea as i said i always like to benchmark what i'm doing so so we tried to to mimic what they were writing in their report and we got almost exactly the same result which we also could get by by sophisticated hand calculations but the thing is that we wanted to see the pressure between the the, the ring type joint gaskets yeah. the metal gaskets and and um and the flames itself so that we could ensure that it wouldn't leak in the end. All right. Yeah. So so then we did it like this. We get all we, we try to model it as conservative as, as possible, the, the 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 gasket, because in the in the API document, the gasket is not modeled. Uh, it, it's just saying that the gasket is kind of a um, boundary condition. So when you have a lift off on one side of the gasket, you have compromised your your integrity of the flange because then you will have leakage. Uh, so we weren't that uh, worried about the stresses in the system. We, we were worried about leakage because uh -huh. according to API, if they if you go into this standard, there is a lot of graphs. It's very nicely done. And there's a lot of graphs there. So you can you can see if you have that bending moment, that internal pressure, you can have no sorry, if you have that this kind of pressure, you can go and see how much bending moment can I have. On that flange, right. together with the axial tension, but the axial tension doesn't play that much role in this, at least in this system. Yeah, yeah, um, but but it was like this: you go in there, you find it, and and um, as I was mentioning, it, it's a conservative method to 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 use, and it works totally fine. But we saw that we could get five times the allowable uh, bending moment by doing this analysis. Yeah. All right. So that was another workaround, and uh, yeah. Okay. So I mean, we got one uh, question, which is more more of a general general question: is how to reduce mm -hmm. nozzle loads on uh, well on nozzle, how to reduce loads on nozzles. I mean, I heard mm -hmm. you saying a few few options like adding flexibility, uh, you know, having a really close look at sporting arrangement to to change mm -hmm. you know the the loads. Um, I also, I mean, if flanges are limiting. You can you can go into real detail by analyzing the flanges as you did with, with yeah the, that, that's like the last resort that's, <laughs> but that's only if the flange is limiting not not like the nozzle load itself um, yeah. one thing I always al also experienced with nozzle loads is to analyze uh, the equipment well it depends a little bit on on what type of equipment you have for pumps it's it's mm -hmm. way more difficult but for cylindrical vessels you could do like an FEA of the vessel and typically the the uh, the allowable loads that you get from an FEA might be higher than the values you get from from a vendor but especially mm -hmm. if you if you include the actual loads of your pipe stress model into the FEA then then you see that that you know the uh, there's, it's way less conservative than any of the assumptions made to to you know get the allowable loads as fixed values into the pipe stress system. So FEA mm. could could typically help as well. But um, yeah, it's it's quite a general question, and I think that's that's also the the most detail we could get. Yeah, and and just a just a little side note to what you just said. It's um, when I'm looking at if I'm struggling with the operational loads on equipment because that's what you're checking basically. You take the operational loads, you check the uh, equipment uh, that it can sustain those loads. Um, but it's important to sh understand the origin of the loads. Yeah. So what I very often do is I take I, I in, in Caesar 2, this is the way I'm doing it. I'm I'm selecting the case that gives me the highest load. 
and then usually you have like the sustained case you have the expansion uh, amplitude or range depending on how you made your load cases yeah. and i'm 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 selecting all of those and i'm, I'm selecting the restraint summary because uh, then i can see if if for example uh, the thermal in this case it was thermal loads that was very dimensioning so you i will see that 90 percent of the loads were thermal okay what do i need to know do with, if it's thermal I need to add flexibility. Yeah. If it is, uh, for example, due to waves, for example, that's your problem because you got some sideways acceleration going back and forth. Then you know that you need more supports. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So that's how I'm uh, assessing: Do we need more support or less support, or maybe sometimes we we need uh, quite a lot of support in that area to kind of uh, get rid of the loads coming in from the outside, but. In general, it's it's always good to take a look at, even though you're not going to use your restraint loads from the expansion case, for example, you're never going to use that for anything else than just looking at them to understand what is the driving factor of your load. Yeah, yeah. I, there's one more question, um, which which part my interest is is uh, from uh, Oscar Diaz is mm -hmm. is it important to include the weight of the supports shoes in the model? I mean, I've never done that. No, I I've never done it myself. <laughs> no, all right. Yeah, I was, I was curious. Yeah. No, I, I don't, I don't think that's of any importance. Um, it, 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 of course, there is special cases always. Uh, it's like, for example, for subsea, where we have the very big supports on the end of manifolds, for example, where we should call the, the hub. Uh, it's like a hub connector uh, system. All right. So the hub itself, it might weigh five hundred kilograms. Yeah. Thousand pounds. And and then it or maybe more. It, that was but it, a low it rate, won't let's move. Say, five tons, probably. for example. It won't move due to friction anyway, right? Ah, uh, it will move because the external loads are extremely high. We got in one case in that that high pressure case that I talked about, we had one thousand three hundred kilonewton meters of bending moment, for example. Oh, wow, yeah. So so. Um, so it, that one might move. Um, so we include that load, that, no, sorry, not, not the load, but the weight of that uh, mass into the system. But for regular pipe support clamps and so on, no, we don't do that. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, yeah. So, I mean, there, there are several more questions on it that we could, could mm -hmm. discuss. I also, uh, I mean, um, uh, as I mentioned, time flies. So, so uh, we can yeah. go into way more detail of, of many of these topics. And I think, you know, maybe uh, we should in, in the near future. Um, mm -hmm. uh, were there any like uh, additional slides or things uh, before I interrupted with the questions that, that you wanted to discuss? Yeah, it was it was a little bit more talk about nonlinearities and and. Um, oh, but that's interesting. Yeah, let's let's. Yeah, so that. I think that let's let's use five minutes on this one. Uh, we could rather go and have another chat on this this in a greater yeah. uh, detail in the future, but but this is a very simple setup as you can see here. Let's say you have a supported two millimeter gap. And you have a displacement over here. It's just pulling it down. Yeah. That's all it does over here. That red arrow is pulling it down. So, so what will happen is, um, um, uh, is that the um, uh, how to say it? It's the um, the support will not act uh, in the beginning. That's the orange here is the force in the set direction. So the support load. And from the support load, yeah, the restraint force. Uh, so as you can see in the beginning, when you start moving it, nothing really happens uh, because there is no contact between the pipe and the yeah. support. So it's just some steps. I just made some steps to kind of um, uh, see what happened. Yeah. And then, um, then uh, this is the force, the, the orange one. And then the blue one is the deflection of the pipe. Yeah, the pipe sense. will be moving linearly uh, until it touches over here, yeah. because it's a linear system uh, until it touches. Yeah. But what we can see is that the behavior of the system afterwards is not linear. The same with the force as well. First there is zero force, and then there is this linear increase of force when we are linearly increasing the applied deflection, right? Yeah. So, so when it touches that deflection. Is going to generate forces over here, and that's what we see here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
it, it depends on what software you're using. Uh, in CSER 2, we are writing the, the load cases, like all the subload cases as well. Um, in, in other softwares, uh, then, for example, Triflex, this is done in the background. So you have the sub case is, is being subtracted automatically. But in this case, I made a very simple uh, comparison. It's like uh, we got two loads, D1, D7. I don't remember why I called it D7, not D2, but anyway. <laughs> um, D1 is, uh, D7 is two times D1, basically. Um, so when we move it with D1, there is zero force, but we got 1.297 millimeters of deflection. Yeah. Maybe this is a little bit hard for for people to see, so I will, I will skip uh, to this one where I enlarged it a little bit. Um, so, so when we move it with D1, that's just a deflection that we added into CSER 2, there is zero contact, zero force. And the deflection is 1.3 millimeters. That means that if you have a two millimeter gap, as in this example, we still have 0.7 millimeters before it touches, yeah. right? And then D7 is two times D1. Um, then it have contact oh, yeah. and deflection is two millimeters. And that's quite obvious because we limited that deflection to two millimeters. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So, so, um, so then, um, then we get a force, it's in contact. And then we just say, what happens if you take D1 plus D7? If you did it like re regular math, like one, has zero seven has 1135 so the answer should be 1135 it shouldn't but let's say that you're thinking that um that would be wrong yeah, and i will show you yeah, yeah. why it's not correct because it's a non-linearity yeah. but but um what we can see here if you then do d1 plus d7 then we have displacement one plus displacement seven that means that we have three times d1 and that means that we have 3614 newtons uh, in the reaction force in the support, yeah. but the deflection of the support is still the same because we are having a gap. A gap can never be more than the gap itself, unless if you added stiffness, then it can move more. But let's take the stiffness out of the equation right now. And then case eight and case nine, they're doing the same thing. In this case, we just took three times D1. As I said, D7 is two times D1. Yeah. So, so this is just three times D1, and, and that gives the same answer in case eight and nine, and that's good, that, that shows that it's working. Yeah, exactly. But then in the case 10, we are just typing yeah. in L1 plus L7, yeah. meaning that we take case one plus case seven, and what is happening inside of, of Caesar in that case, it takes the numerical values you got already, yeah. zero plus 1135 is 1135. Yeah. It takes 1.297 plus 2. That gives you 3.297. And here you can clearly see that there's something weird going on. Yeah, yeah so basically, basically and that, what this shows is that adding the loads and then doing the full calculation of how the how the loads distribute in the system gives a different result than, than having a look at the separate loads and then combining the results. Mm -hmm. So, so what I'm trying to say is that when you combine results or subtract, uh, well, subtract is, is typically more safe because then you get the, um, uh, what do you call it? The, um, uh, the leftover, so to say, uh, and you get the correct support conditions and so on. But I see in sometimes people is like, okay, but why can't I just, I just add the different loads like temperature one, pressure one, weight and everything we just add them at different load cases and we sum them up in the end yeah well it is it's a nice idea but then you just sum the values together you don't sum the real conditions of your system unless unless th th it can work if your system is a linear system yeah yeah meaning there is zero gap there is zero friction then that can work uh, but in cases when there is a gap well or lift then off, you cannot or do lift it. off in that sense Sorry? Or a lift off, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, or a lift off, for example. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, in the course, we're going to talk a lot more about these kind of combinations and, and, and how it matter, why you take one operational case minus another operational case to, to, to uh, find the, uh, the occasional stress, for example, or to find the temperature range and all these kind of things. Yeah. It's got to be much more clear. Um, all right. Yeah. Awesome. And just 
before we round off today, I see that we are 30 minutes over, but um, it, we got a, a special request for how to model a swivel joint, um, meaning that if you have, for example, uh, a flange that is, a, is allowed to rotate around one of the degrees of freedom, that's basically what it is. We need to open up one of the degrees of freedom. Yeah. So uh, this is just a, a simple test I made um, uh, earlier today, just to, to kind of prove the point. It's that in this case, we have an anchor over here. We got a piping element node 15 to 20. It might be a little bit small to see. Um, and then it's not connected. This element is not 20 to 30. This element is 21 to 30 because we're going to use a C node, yeah. a connection node. Yeah. So in this case, we use the, the node 20 as the main main um, uh, node, and then the C node is node 21. And then type X, type Y, type C, that means that we are restricting movement in X, Y, and C. Yeah. But we do it in, in the relative um, coordinate system to the element, not to the global yeah. system. Yeah, so you basically connected both piping sections in those degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. and, then... and then we do the same for the rotational Rx, Ry. Yeah. And then we got the RC. If we left the RC out of this, it would not be connected. Then you have a fully swivel joint. In this case, I just wanted to, to show that you can also add, for example, a gap in it. Oh, yeah. So, so if you have a rotation, uh, we, we've done, done it sometimes for sub C, is that we have a actually almost like a ball joint. It, it's very interesting. So, so when you have bending on it, it can move uh, up to three degrees, I think, plus minus three degrees. The range is six degrees. And, and if it moves more, then it's stopped. So in that case, we would type in three degrees as the gap here. Uh, in the direction that we wanted. Um, the benefit here is that now we can see that if we get a force, or, or not a force, but a moment, of course, um, that means that the gap is closed and that we have exceeded or, or hit the limit of that swivel joint yeah. or, or the ball, ball joints. Yeah. Do they do so, swivel joints provide like zero um, uh, strength in those directions? Yeah, zero or low friction, or even some some of them do provide some friction. Uh, not sure how I would model that into Caesar two, but I've done some modeling of those into Triflex, for example, yeah. where we define the rotational stiffness. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you can actually do it here as well. You can add yeah. the rotational stiffness. Say so, yeah. Um, then you can you can actually model it. Um, Maybe even a bilinear rotational support if you have two like frictions mm -hmm. okay that, that might be uh... yeah it's not that often that we use them anyway but uh so i just made three load cases d1 d2 d3 0 0.5 degrees rotation one degree rotation and 1.5 degree rotation so that's that arrow here with a with a torque around it yeah. um, or a torsion so d1 should not generate any reaction load d2 should also not generate anything but d3 should generate something yeah. Yeah. And that's what we what we can see here in the anchor over here, the red one, there is zero loads in the first two cases, 0 0.5 and one degree rotation. In the in the last one, we get a reaction moment of 8046 Newton meters. Yeah. Which is transferred through this joint yeah. over here. Once the glide gap is closed. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That is the way of modeling swivel joints or basically modeling degrees of freedom. It could be maybe it's not a pipe continuing and it could be like a support that's connected to another pipe. It could be these C nodes can be used for a lot of things. Yeah, definitely. I mean, and in other software, it might be called something else like release elements, link element, joint elements. Yeah, basically a lot of different names for them, but they all do the same thing. All right. I mean, um... I have one more question, which I find really interesting, which is from uh, Hanan. Um, mm -hmm. Hanan, thanks for asking the question. Uh, it, it's a little bit related to the, the visual that you have on the, the bottom right of the screen. So, so the vectors and the, the force vectors and in the different directions. The question mm -hmm. is, um, why can you put uh, uniform loads of X, Y, and Z in separate vectors, vector one for X, vector two for Y, vector, vector three for Z? 
Uh, whereas mm -hmm. you can also put them in one vector and then use the different components of that vector. Um, yes. I mean, I mean, uh, my, is my first response would be to, to get more knowledge yep. about, about the load and the response of the system, right? Yeah, but I, th I think also maybe, uh, maybe I'm answering wrongly here, but I think also what he's asking is that uh, what we very often do in, in Stressman is that let's say that we have a, a uh, displacement over here, but we might have a lot of combination of that displacement. Uh, as you know, Luke, I think there's like nine vectors. Yeah, it's nine vectors here. You cannot have infinite number of net vectors, not, at least not in CSO2 2019. Uh, other software, you can do that. But the way of doing it here is that you define, for example, vector one is dx. Type just the number one in here, one, one, one. You make it like a diagonal matrix here, which is just typing one, 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 one. Meaning that D1 in your analysis will be one millimeter deflection or one inch or whatever your, your units are in the X direction. And then in the Y direction, it means that D2 is going to be uh, one millimeter deflection in that direction. And, and that's how we can build it uh, with a lot of cases. Because you can write, as I was showing here, um, you can have three times D1. So if you want to move, in case one of the cases, you want to move uh, the pipe three millimeters, not one millimeter, you just type three times D1. Yeah. And then maybe you want to lift it up two millimeters in the Y direction, you type plus two times D2. Yeah, exactly. And, and so on, and you build and we build cases and in sub C combinations, we can have 64, 128 cases. Basically the mind is the limit there. Oh, so. Yeah. We, we try to kind of limit it down to, to 64, 128, sometimes 256 cases. Uh, but I've been up to 4,096 cases one time. Oh, that's crazy. Uh, in combinations yeah. uh, of these, these, these the, the, the directional vectors and, and so on. So um, Yeah, but I, th I think that's, that's a valid answer. So my first take was put them in different vectors such that you can find you know the influence of each component and, and mm -hmm. a better understanding of of the stress responses due to each i mean a, a, a high load or displacement in one direction might might solve your issue while the other direction doesn't really matter but but then also combine all of them in one load case in the end to see if of course the combination um mm -hmm. but i think your point is valid you know if you just use uh, the matrix like this one as uh, you fill it with ones in the diagonal and mm -hmm. zeros in the other ones, then you have full flexibility in the load cases to make combinations any way you want to. Yeah, it, it gives more insight uh, in my opinion as well, because then you have like one load yeah. case table, which has all the representations of the different loads in there. And, and as I said, sometimes we don't have enough vectors, so we yeah. would need to copy up more files, but instead of having more files, you can, you can use a diagonal. Uh, it also goes for accelerations, for example. Yeah. And it goes for uh, for forces. You can use the same diagonal uh, vector. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I did, did a webinar together with Hexagon on this uh, earlier, which is called a shallow dive into deep waters. Um, that is um, that is addressing exactly this this topic. Ah, interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. So so um, uh, can they find the webinar somewhere? Uh, on Hexagon's homepage somewhere. I mean, what I think we can do after I'll, this talk, I'll look them up, yeah. put out a link there I'll, I'll, and, I'll, and people can. I'll, I'll make mm -hmm. sure, like, uh, spend some time to, to uh, organize the show I notes. actually think if you still see my screen, oh, uh, it's it's quite small text over here. But on the side here, uh, you can see that there is uh, webinars if you have Caesar 2. And then, yeah, I can actually click on it. So. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll put you know, I'll, I'll organize level. some show notes, uh, Sandra, and, and for everyone mm -hmm. listening. Perfect. Um, and I mean, uh, you know, there might be people that are not Caesar users that are listening, so so some might be relevant, others not. But uh, we we discussed yeah. several topics that are outside the, you know, engineering trainer scope. So some some might be uh, regarding this webinar mm -hmm. or regarding uh, software that we touched base on. Um, I can just list them uh, below this video. Um, yeah, exactly. So on the top here right now, I highlighted the link. Uh, if you're still showing my screen, though, um, 
So uh, and and it's like you're saying, this is this is of course in Caesar two that that webinar, but still, it gives some insights on on subsea engineering and and subsea um, calculations in accordance with ASMA eight. No, sorry, not ASMA eight, but ASMA B to one point eight, yeah. and and. Um, and and uh, also some brief talks about the DMV OS F101. They changed name though, but um, um, I think it's interesting. And uh, I usually watch a lot of different type of webinars, for, even though we don't have the software. It's always something we can pick up in in and learn from from the different softwares and not softwares, but from different webinars. I would say this this topic regarding the. Uh, building the load cases, etc., will definitely be be addressed in more discussions and detail in in the course. Uh, yeah. Starting, uh, you know, in February. Um, mm -hmm. Then, then you have you know a lot of time to to do like more uh, more detailed discussions. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I'm I'm uh, I suggest to start wrapping up, Sandra. I mean, uh, uh, yeah. we've been talking for well over one and a half hour, which has been great. <laughs> thanks, thanks for your time. Yeah. Uh, thank you and and uh, uh having said that you know i uh, <coughs> i enjoyed it a lot and i think you know the the more we talk the more topics come up that that uh, um, are worth discussing further but but we won't do that today perhaps we will find the time uh, uh, soon mm -hmm. um uh i would like to you know point all this uh, point out to all listeners you know uh, that uh, uh, we'll add the details of this discussion in the show notes have a look at at the uh, upcoming course um let me just show you the discount coupon one more time yeah um yeah there you go So, so um, that will be a course that starts on February 8th, uh, and that will, uh, will include 16 hours of, of you know, Sondre, uh, Juan, Jonathan, uh, s senior people in, his, uh, in the Stressman team, mm -hmm. discussing a lot of topics uh, related to um, pipe stress and pr basically building like a complete overview of, of the field. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we designed together with, with Stressman and engineering, we, we designed the course such that it is, uh, we feel perfect for pipe stress engineers, junior pipe stress engineers with say zero to five years of experience, um, but also uh, uh, design, piping design engineers, piping lead engineers, especially that need to grasp like, like the, the basics of, of pipe stress, um, even though they don't have to do the analysis themselves. So, uh, so the course has been set up for those audiences. You know, if, if mm -hmm. that sparks your interest, have a look at engineeringtrainer.com um, and then the Stressman courses. And you can use the coupon that is in the, in the screen at the moment, Stressman Online Course, to, to uh, get a nice discount. Yeah, no, that's perfectly wrapped up. I just wanted to, to add that, um, as you say, it's going to give an, a good overview of, of almost every topic there is to pipe stress. <laughs> of course, we don't dig that deep into a lot of the topics, but we're going to dig deep when it comes to to primary and secondary loads uh, and, and stresses. That is something I see is a lot of confusion on uh, in, in the market and, and um, what does these words actually mean? And, and for example, why is the allowable stress much higher for secondary stress than, than primary stresses yeah. and so on? So that's that's going to be discussed in detail. The so same with the load combinations. We are going to try to really uh, make people understand what they're doing. And that's that's my mantra when I'm doing stuff. It's like, I want to understand why it's like that. I don't need people to tell me, oh, you do this, this, this. Exactly. But, but that's a part of the course. It's like we try to, at least these kind of topics, we try to give the, the, the background of it. And, and so you actually understand it rather than just copy pasting uh, what I'm doing. Yeah, you know? yeah, pushing buttons. Yeah, yeah, I totally mm -hmm. agree. Yeah, pushing buttons, exactly. All right. So so on that note, right. uh, yeah, let's uh, uh, wrap this up. I mean, I'm sure, Sandra, I will shoot you like new requests or invites to, to have online discussions. I mean, we might take a little bit more closed scopes and, and, and do a little deep dive. That would be nice someday. 
um, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, you know for for all of you listening uh, i invite you to to uh, subscribe to the youtube channel that's that's one of the best ways to see uh, the new live streams coming up we intend to do one every week um, on engineering trainer uh, tv with with different specialists and experts that that we collaborate with um, follow the linkedin pages of stressman engineering and and uh, engineering trainer um, that that's also one of the more important social uh, media outlets that that uh, uh, well at least we and i also think stressman use um, and uh, thanks for joining us thanks again sandra for, for your time and uh, have a great day to all of you thank you luke you take care all right have a good one cheers bye-bye bye-bye so,